Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is very strange, but um, welcome to Appalachia Audubon's October program meeting. I am this year's president, Donna Laguerre. And as I said, it's strange, I'm looking at my iPad and I'm not seeing any of you out there, but I will do my best. It has been a challenging year having to do everything virtually, but we want you to know that we are here and continue to work for Appalachia Audubon. We have a dynamic board. Everyone has risen to the occasion. I would like to recognize and thank one board member in particular. It would be rough going without our Zoom coordinator and communication committee chair, Dara Wilson. She runs all of our board meetings with Zoom and is behind the scenes tonight. She reminds me to tell you that your mics will not be activated tonight, but please use the chat feature to ask questions during the program. They will be answered at the end. Our theme this year is access to nature, which is very broad and even includes experiencing nature in your own yard, which was the topic of September's webinar by Doug Tallamy. I hope that most of you watched it. If you did not, go to our website, appalachie.org, where you will find the link. The most common question after the webinar was, how do I get started in my area? So as a follow-up, we have created a video filmed by our vice president, Kathleen Carr, just last Sunday at the home of fellow board member and conservation chair, Rob Williams. This video will help you get started on your own conservation corridor or wildlife habitat. Google YouTube Appalachia Audubon or find the link on our website, appalachie.org. In just a minute, program chair Ben Rangel will introduce tonight's speaker on another aspect of access to nature. But first, board member Heather Levy will tell you about next month's program and an exciting project that will add to our ongoing involvement at Lake Alberta. Again, providing access to nature, this time on the south side. There's that theme again. As always, we continue to work on a variety of conservation issues, from having input into blueprint projects, to opposing the MCOR Suncoast Toll Road, supporting purchases of Florida Forever land in our region, and many others. So we are staying engaged. With that, I will turn it over to Heather, we are glad you are here. Hey everyone. So please mark your calendar and save the date for next month's meeting, um, which will be November 19th at 7 p.m. via Zoom, uh, where myself and Peter Kleinhens will be talking about how to build your eBirding skills. We're going to discuss how to use eBird on both the mobile and online platform, and we're going to talk about how eBird data informs scientific research and conservation of bird populations especially with the ongoing threat of climate change. Please look out for links on our Facebook page, as well as links that'll be sent through email in the upcoming weeks. We hope to see you all there. We also have some exciting news on the Lake Alberta project. This semester's FSU Sustainability Fellow, Sarah Calzada, has partnered with Appalachia Audubon, the City of Tallahassee, and Gainesville's Luby Bat Conservancy to install a bat house at Lake Alberta this winter. Just like our feathered flying friends, our flying mammal friends are also seeing unprecedented population declines. So we're really excited to be able to provide some habitat where we can see and enjoy them. We are currently seeking donations to help offset costs of construction and installation. Please contact our fellow Sarah Calzada at the email listed below. Hi, my name is Ben Rangel, and I'm with the Appalachia Audubon Programming Committee. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, David Jones of the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association. I saw David speak last February at a conference, and I found his presentation to be very eye-opening. Um, David is someone who took a very bad situation and turned it into something very positive, not just for himself, but for everyone around him. Um, but when David speaks, it's not just about his story. It's about how we can all become more aware of those around us who have abilities that are different than our own and what can be done to welcome those people into spaces where they're not traditionally accommodated, especially the outdoors. 
Um, that's why I'm very proud to introduce David Jones of the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association. David? Okay, yes, thank you, Ben. Appreciate it very much. And yes, I did enjoy that presentation at the Watch for Wildlife Conference. A lot of like-minded people, just as we have here with the Audubon chapter. Um, it's always nice to be a, around folks who get it and have a same, I guess, base of love for nature and the outdoors. So I'm glad to be here and I appreciate the invitation. And we do want to talk about outdoors and outdoor recreation. And your, your theme, Access to Nature, is perfect because really that's the theme and the whole uh, basis for my creation of the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association years ago, as I had a chance to really evaluate my past and uh, my future and realizing how important nature and outdoors has been to me personally, led me down the path I've been on. So I'd like to tell you about my story and how I got to where I'm at today and a little bit about what we've accomplished with the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association and what it means to people uh, of all ages and all abilities. Uh, but first, I think a little infomercial would be appropriate to kind of give you a little sense of what the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association does, why we do it, and some of the people we serve. I've got a little three minute video that I think Dara will queue up for you, and I'll let you watch that, and then I will introduce myself a little more and get into our program. I love it. It just it's exhilaration. Uh, the fact that people tell me I can't, and you know, that just makes me want to do it all that much worse. When you look at quality of life, of course you look at your health and you look at your job and you look at your everyday living and housing, but many people fail to take into consideration the importance of playtime. You're not working all the time, you're not sleeping all the time. What you do in your leisure time defines your quality of life. We believe that everybody has the ability to become active in some type of leisure activities. Recreation and an active leisure improves your life. It improves the life of everyone, walking or rolling, sighted or non-sighted. We believe everybody needs to have the opportunity to get involved and participate. That's what sports building is all about. We bring people here to show them what they can do, how they can do it, how they can get involved and enjoy a better life as a result of that experience. The sense of freedom is so important. I mean, you've been hearing that word over and over in our news, freedom for oppressed people. Well, think about the freedom that this affords people, that sports affords people to, that may not have thought that they could or had been told, oh, now you're a cripple, you're stuck in this wheelchair, you can't do anything, you're not able to do anything. And they come to an event like this and they see that they can and that's what's so important is that freedom of knowing that you can do. People with disabilities need the same things in life that people without disabilities need. Leisure, recreation leads to a quality of life for people. Uh, this is a place and a venue where people of all abilities, all ages, all demographics can come out here and have fun, enjoy themselves, meet new people, um, hopefully get involved with some activity that they can carry into their everyday life and because of being more active can become a healthier, more well-adjusted, adjusted, uh, socialized member of society. Sportsability is not just a day for people with disabilities. Sportsability is a day that we can all come together as a community and come out and have fun with no barriers, with no difficulties of dealing with who's who and what's what. We're all the same. People come out to volunteer and to help out, and you know, they become as much a participant as a person with a disability because they are gaining a, a wonderful experience that's probably going to touch their life as much as the ones that they are helping. And that's a lesson that many people don't learn in life, that helping others will help yourself, and the more you help people do things, the more you're helping yourself, 
Our volunteers love it, and many of them are here every year, and they can't wait to come back. And we change lives of people without disabilities by involvement with sports ability. Okay, so that was my little cheap way to get an infomercial in about our sports ability event. It's uh, an event that we do annually, and we've done it around the state of Florida for 30 years now. Uh, multiple cities, Tallahassee is where we started and still continue to do it every year. Sarasota, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, Orlando, Gainesville, Ocala. We've done these types of events around the state for years and have touched a lot of lives and uh, really uh, brought in partners and really moved the concept and the movement of accessibility and inclusion into mainstream using recreation as a tool. And because of my history and my background, outdoor recreation has always been my niche, if you will, and uh, thus the creation of the FTOA. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story, just so you can kind of understand uh, the path I took to get where I'm at today, doing what I love to do, and that's uh, directing and running the Florida Disabled Outdoors Association. I'm a Tallahassee native, and that's why it sounds like I'm from Georgia. This accent is really a North Florida original accent, uh, but I love Tallahassee. It's a small town that's getting large, uh, but it has a lot to offer as far as the nature and outdoors. I grew up enjoying uh, the uh, outdoor recreation here, fishing and hunting and hiking and skiing and fishing. And the things that we do around Tallahassee were great. We got a great location here. I'm giving a plug for my area because we're close to the coast, you know, 20, 30 miles away from the beaches and the coastal area, big natural areas, the forest, St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge, uh, then we go a little bit north into the plantation country where we have a lot of the large plantations that have really helped preserve and conserve the outdoors and our natural resources we have on big property private owners. Uh, just a nice place to live. Growing up here has been wonderful. I grew up in a Winn-Dixie grocery store. So that's kind of my roots. I started bagging groceries when I was 15 years old and ended up staying with them for 14 years until I finally left. And, moved on and opened my own business when I was, I think, 34 years old. Uh, but it, it was a great path uh, to learn a lot about big business. I uh, never saw myself living and working in a grocery store the rest of my life. So that's why when I uh, made the decision to get out of here, I didn't want to be Mr. Whipple squeezing toilet paper in a grocery store as I aged into retirement. I wanted to do some own things. So I did leave Winn-Dixie and opened up my own business for a few years and then actually sold my business and then went into health and life insurance and enjoyed a, a rural life insurance sales agent role for years, meeting a lot of rural people and traveling the outdoor North Florida and South Georgia areas. But one spring morning, my life changed very quickly and very drastically. Uh, I had met an, a new acquaintance when I had my small business. I met a wildlife artist who came around and offered to uh, paint me a, an original wildlife painting of a deer. He knew I was an outdoors person. But I kind of changed his direction because I love birds. I said, what I'd like you to do is paint me some mallards in a cypress pond that I could identify with and really love. So I became friends with Jimmy Dollar, who is now passed, uh, but he was a, a local artist that has done a lot of uh, wildlife paintings and prints. Uh, he did a painting for me and I got to be friends with him. He told me that he had turkey hunted in the past but hadn't been in a long time. So I promised him I was gonna take him turkey hunting when I found the appropriate place and time. And I did, I took Jimmy out and due to just an unfortunate series of incidences led up to a tragic accident where Jimmy uh, decided I was the turkey and he shot me and I survived a very serious brain injury. that left me nine days in a coma and uh, then three months in a rehabilitation hospital, struggling to survive and then struggling to rehabilitate and try to get back to some normalcy. Um, from being a very active person my whole life to all of a sudden waking up out of a coma, uh, paralyzed, hemiplegic, my left side totally paralyzed, uh, had double vision, I couldn't even talk, 
I had no body con uh, strength, so I couldn't sit up. I was really devastated. I was not the same body that I had went down with. But my rehab was very successful. I wasn't expected to live. I wasn't expected to walk. Uh, I wasn't expected to talk. But I do, and now I, I can't stop talking. And I walk as much as I can. But it's changed my life because the experiences and the lessons I've learned along the way have been very valuable. Three months in a hospital, staring at a ceiling, uh, not knowing what the future held for me, gave me a lot of time to recall the past. I didn't see myself visualizing my experiences selling steaks and pork and beans at Winn-Dixie or my little private business I had for two years, uh, nor selling health and life insurance and all those great uh, times that I had doing that. What I really thought about and what kept me going were all of my trips and visits and adventures and outdoor recreation uh, excursions that I went on. Fishing, hunting, boating with family and friends is what I recalled, and those were the memories that were so pleasant to me. So that kind of kept me going. Uh, as I progressed through my rehab, doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, basically learning how to live again, which is what rehabilitation is, new life. I was beginning my new life in a hospital setting with a group of other people with very serious disabilities. Uh, learned a lot from them and being around them, learned a lot of lessons about disability. I had never encountered disability in a personal perspective at that point in my life. I was always a young, active, go-getter, uh, if you can't keep up, get off the porch kind of guy, you know, looking out for yourself and, and just doing what most young people do is just living fast and living large. Well, as I've got to know people and spent time in a, in a hospital with all these different disabilities, I begin to realize that people are people, whether they could walk or see or had one arm or two arms or with all their disabilities, we were all people. And the time I spent getting to know them is when I really realized that these people are just me. It's us. It's our parents. It's our children. It's our neighbors. It's our employees. It's our uh, employers. You know, people with disabilities are everywhere. And, you know, once I got into that realm of thinking that, you know, we're just people, uh, some of the therapies that really had an impact on me that I didn't realize at the time along with the other therapies, was my therapeutic recreation uh, experiences. Uh, about twice a week, we would get together and do games and little, uh, uh, well, little sports activities, simple things like batting a little ball around a room or simple little games that, you know, you, I would never think of David Jones doing and enjoying. But I enjoyed it because it gave me time to socialize and do things with these other folks. Uh, being an outdoors person, the therapeutic recreation program uh, helped me do a personal assessment of what I've done in the past, the activities, the things I enjoyed doing, the things that I would like to do again in the future, uh, my disability, my abilities, and kind of created a recreation plan or a life plan, basically, uh, using recreation as kind of a tool to motivate to get people back in involved and inspired to living again, to enjoy life. Well, I still have that assessment that I did, and it's amazing. It was all outdoor activities that I really highlighted that I enjoyed doing. A lot of it was team sports. I'm a Seminole, uh, and, you know, uh, team sports and, and organized spectator sports are great, but the outdoor hands-on uh, experiences is what really stuck in my mind, and that's what I really wanted to get back to. Found in a little electric fishing reel in a catalog, uh, that would enable me to fish with one hand. I was one-handed and still remain limited. No use of one in my left hand. Uh, my right hand still has function, but it's getting weaker and weaker as I age. But I had to figure out what can I do now? I love to fish and I want to fish again. I ordered that electric fishing reel. And when it came, we planned my first trip out of the hospital to go fishing. So I was fortunate enough to have a family that had a house down on Lake Calhoun. My mom lived there. Uh, and had a pontoon boat. Uh, we took a trip out of the hospital and they had a pontoon boat. It was an old boat, had a narrow door. My wheelchair wouldn't fit on the boat. They did not have a sidewalk or a path down to the lake. It was steep stairs. So they knew I was coming home. So my family started doing some adaptations and modifications early on because they knew I had to get to that boat to go fishing. 
So they built me a sidewalk or a path around the hill. My brother remodeled the boat, made the door wider, made a ramp on the dock and uh, enabled me to get my wheelchair onto that boat. So we took off on my first little adventure out with my new electric reel uh, with my family, my mother, my wife, and my daughter, and a couple of my brothers. And uh, I call it a perfect chamber of commerce day. Blue skies, white puffy clouds, perfect temperature in the spring, started across the lake and all the fish knew that this was a show day. Fish were jumping, birds were flying. It was just a perfect day. I loved it and I just realized that I'm out here and I'm still alive and these are the things that I love. We went fishing, I didn't catch a fish. Doesn't matter, don't go fishing to catch a fish. That's just the excuse you use to go fishing. You go fishing and you do outdoor adventures because you want to be in, in nature and enjoy that time to reconnect or revive or just experience nature and to be with your family and friends. And that's what I really realized at that time. But it gave me the motivation and the inspiration to get out there and get going again. So that was one of the key points that I think that really made me realize how important nature and outdoor recreation was to me. And then as I progressed, left the hospital, uh, had the opportunity to go back to school. So I returned to Florida State University and uh, continued where I'd left off years earlier, uh, where I thought I was going to be a marine biologist. So I've always had interest in the outdoors and, and the uh, marine life and, and nature and biology, but chemistry changed my mind. So I had changed my major to business, thank goodness. So I went back to SU and continued my business major and got a degree in marketing. Uh, but during that process, of going back to school and kind of starting over again. Um, I took a career development class where you really plan out, your, you know, you assess your strengths and your weaknesses, and then you kind of create a plan to your education and your occupational or career path. And I decided what I wanted to do was to create an organization to help people like myself who had a disability, who was trying to get back to life by providing recreational opportunities uh, that I had that impact and that, that vision, I guess, early on. This was 1988 when I got shot. So as some of you may know, I hope you learn or will realize that in 1990, the world changed. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and it made it illegal to discriminate against people who were different, people who had disabilities. Uh, and that's in all sectors of life, you know, from education, transportation, occupational things, public accommodations, including recreation. So in 1990, when that law passed, the country was trying to figure out what does this mean and how are we gonna do that? Uh, nobody really had the answers. There were no experts back then, but I, I found a mobility impaired hunt that Fish and Wildlife Commission had offered down in Three Lakes. I went down to that hunt and experienced that hunting opportunity. Uh, loved the opportunity to go somewhere and go hunting again very limited on what I could do and totally lost on how to hunt down in Three Lakes, which is a whole different world than up here in North Florida. But I realized that there was no support, no help, no program. It was only a date and a place on a map. Well, I came back to Tallahassee after that experience. I was kind of disappointed in what was offered to me. And I kept thinking we can do better than this. So I put together a plan on how a mobility impaired hunt could be offered to people with mobility impairments that would enable them an enjoyable and safe and productive hunting situation. Took that concept to the wildlife refuge, Robin Will, anybody that knows Robin here is real innovative and open-minded, and created the, the first mobility impaired hunt in the refuge system in the United States. Held that hunt, it was very successful. We had probably a dozen mostly wheelchair users and other limited mobility folks and enjoyed and participated in the program. Kind of refined it the next year, made it a little better, got more people. Uh, I think we ended up having 40 people that participated in the first couple of years. Uh, very successful. I took that successful program to the Fish and Wildlife Commission and said, here's what we need to do. Uh, Vic Keller, who is no longer with us, was the director at the time. And he says, David, I get it and we're gonna do this. So started working under his leadership to find and create mobility impaired hunts around the state of Florida. And now we have 23 different hunts that serve, I think about 2,500 
mobility impaired persons right now and the numbers are growing all the time that enables them a great outdoor experience. That's kind of some of my early days of ADA compliance and accessibility and access to outdoors. Uh, your theme and the word access and accessibility sometimes are interchangeable and sometimes they mean totally different things. I've been real involved with the conservation world supporting our SCORP plan and work with the DEP with state parks on their accessibility and inclusion plans. I serve on the ADA Compliance Committee for Fish and Wildlife. I uh, work with a lot of county governments and other private uh, entities creating accessible facilities, physical accessibility issues. But I've always been real big on programs. Programmatic access is very important, which is different from physical access. Uh, working with the refuge system, they asked me to create a training program that I actually did and then delivered to 15 wildlife refuges in the Southeast United States and actually went out to California and did one as well. But I was in the early days of trying to figure out what the ADA meant and how do we adhere to the new laws? How do we eliminate discrimination? And how do we eliminate barriers to include people of all abilities into our programs? our facilities and our programs. So did a lot of training. So I was able to teach managers, property managers, program managers, but I was also able to learn more about the American Disabilities Act and more about the law. So as I was teaching my little piece, I was learning a lot more about accessibility and the bigger picture of accessibility and issues. Uh, as time progressed and worked with a lot of entities, the sports ability event came along that you saw the little teaser for. That was really a grassroots event that we started as a sit water skiing program that grew over the years. And as I said before, we do them now year round. Uh, we do them different now. Everybody does everything different now, including presentations like this. But it's been a very successful program to introduce people to things they can do and how and when and where they can do it. The why, I don't think I need to get on my soapbox to teach or tell you why outdoor recreation is so important. You know that or you wouldn't be on this webinar tonight, that's for sure. So we all have that in, in, in common, but there is a, a relationship between outdoor recreation and conservation. A lot of times we get the two kind of disconnected and we have to realize that to conserve and protect our natural resources, all recreation users need to really unite and, and stay together to promote and advocate for what we love. <coughs> Excuse me. If we don't learn to appreciate nature and to enjoy it, then we will not place value on it. And if we don't value that, then we're not going to work hard to protect it. We're not going to advocate. We're not going to spend our money. We're not going to try to pass laws. We're not going to try to protect it. So it's very important to get people outdoors and active. Now I have. I guess two, two, <coughs> excuse me, two main reasons to do that. One is conservation, but two is for our health. As we know, outdoor recreation is very important and, and very good, Dara. You're catching up now. You understand how I can get distracted there. Our Florida Disabled Outdoor Association, that's our mission, and it's very simple. You know, enhance the lives of recreation, and, and that's what we're all about. And again, that's what one of the values of outdoor recreation is. We're enhancing the lives to get people healthier happier and more productive. Go ahead, Dara, hit the next slide there and we'll move forward. Okay, some of you may be familiar with what we call the R3 initiative. Now, that's aimed toward hunters and anglers because it's a Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, program here in Florida, but it's a national effort to recruit, retain, and reactivate hunters and anglers. But what I've done is replace that hunters and anglers with outdoor recreation because I truly believe that even though we've got differences between the bird watchers and the bird hunters, we still have a very much common love for and desire to protect our natural resources. So I really think we need to work out our differences and, and come together just as our country is split up now. We need to work together. Now, working together and why it's important. You know, I realized the disability issue early on because I got shot in the head 
Now, what I hope is I can help people understand the importance and the value of people with disabilities before you get shot in the head to make you understand that. And I'm just teasing you a little bit, but the numbers are significant. You know, over 56 million people have significant disabilities and that's about 15 to 20 percent of our population and growing all the time. So it's a very, it's the second largest minority. Uh, so you think about it, uh, disabilities is a very non-prejudiced, non-discriminating minority. We accept people into our little club, if you will, or our labeled group of people having disabilities every day. People are joining our ranks, you know. People are born with disabilities. People are acquiring disabilities through all kinds of accidents and injuries, uh, illnesses and diseases. So it's disability happens every day. And then uh, if you're lucky, you will uh, age out and won't have a disability. But the statistics show as we age, when you become 65, you know, 40% of us are gonna have a disability. Now, many people who are seniors don't really claim that they have a disability, but uh, we do. Uh, disability really is just a definition, but it's a very significant part and it's a normal part of life. And again, uh, some of the stats there, and I want to digress a little bit here. I want you to understand that this presentation has a lot of facts and details that I'm not going to ramble through and read to you. You can read the screen as I give you my little pitch on, on what I'm trying to conquer and get you to understand. And this will be available for you to look at later on. A lot of you may be program managers, and it would be very good for you to use this as training for some of your people and staff, or if you're just an individual that really wants to understand more about disability which you will probably become unless you get lucky and die young. Again, I, I off color, a little joke there, but that's a fact. Uh, everybody will become disabled at a point in time. Uh, so anyway, go ahead, Daryl. And again, I think I already told you that, that over 40% of people 65 have disability and children, our children now, one in 12 are diagnosed with disabilities. Now, I don't know if that's an increase re in real reality or if that's really now we're diagnosing all these conditions, you know, the ADHDs and some of the other autism and some of the conditions that have been conditions for a long time. They seem to be increasing and they probably are. I know there's a lot more being diagnosed and accepted and realized. So our children are a big part of the disability world now. And that's our next generation of outdoors people and our conservationists. So we need to indoctrinate our children into the outdoors and get them to uh, value nature. So they will be our tomorrow's protectors. Okay, so what is the difference? I'm talking about disabilities and impairments and uh, you've heard me use those words. There are definite definitions for the words and they do mean a little bit different things, each one. They've been interchanged uh, quite frequently, sometimes very inappropriately. So I'm going to show you a couple of definitions there. there. Impairment. You heard me say mobility impaired. Uh, that's basically just some deviation from normal. Uh, so if you have a mobility impairment, then your mobility is less than what you would call normal function. And that's basically an impairment. So that's kind of a, a physical or even a mental deviation from normal development. Now, what's a disability? If we're calling that an impairment, a disability is really nothing but an impairment that has a definition attached to it that the ADA uh, has determined is how we uh, define or determine if you have a disability or not. So uh, it's really a physical or medical impairment that we've already talked about that limits lifestyles and it, you know, that's some of the rules that we use for diagnosis and for uh, things like disability benefits and what have you. But anyway, disability is just a, a, a defined impairment. <coughs> now, what kind of disabilities do we have? Gosh, we have a lot of different disabilities. And uh, there's laying out some of them right there that are kind of matched up. We have people, things you're born with, I mentioned before, then you have things that are acquired. You have disabilities that are visible, 
then you have disabilities that are hidden. You have disabilities that are permanent and will always be with you. And then we have our temporary disabilities that are broken legs and sprained ankles and uh, sand in your eye, you know, just so many temporary things. Uh, you can be stable with your disability or you can have a whole body disability. Uh, disabilities can get worse, disabilities can get better. Uh, disabilities are just a, a wide assortment of different conditions. Uh, and a lot of people have multiple disabilities. So disability is, is a unique thing that uh, we're all gonna experience and just need to learn more about disability so it can be uh, respective and, and a little bit empathetic about people with different conditions. Now, handicap, we mentioned handicap a while ago. Uh, handicap, we don't define people as handicapped. A handicap is the barrier that we place in front of people that, that uh, prevents them from enjoying uh, participation or access. Uh, so handicapped is out, but a handicap may be that set of stairs. Handicapped is not the person in that chair that you're looking at. The handicap are those stairs. Those stairs weren't there. That lady's perfectly able to roll right where she wants to go. So you need to think about that. The handicap is the barrier. Okay, and, and speaking of that thought of what's a barrier and what's a handicap and what's a disability, there's kind of a shift now uh, that we're hoping really gathers steam and we can get people to understand that a disability is not a problem that a person has, that the, that's not the issue. The issue is how do we remove barriers and how do we open up society and opportunities so that person with a different function or different uh, impairment can participate in society. So instead of changing the person, what we wanna do is change the environment. Okay, now words matter. <laughs> and this, I laugh because it's, it's so relevant in today's world. Man, you see and hear all kind of crazy things nowadays. And words do matter. What you say has an effect on people, has an effect on what people think. <clears throat> so we need to really think about how we use our words. And in that context, in the disability world, there's ways we talk to and with people with disabilities that are, are very positive and appropriate. And then there's ways that are negative and less appropriate and actually do damage and do harm. So. We'll talk a little bit about words. Uh, we, we like to em embrace and help people understand the correct way to speak with and about and to people with disabilities is by using people first language. That's kind of a, a funny little term, but if you think about it, it really defines on how we need to speak. People first. It's not a disabled person. It's a person with a disability. Uh, it's not a person, it's not a, you know, uh, handicapped person, it's a person who has a disability. It's not a hiker, a uh, disabled hiker, it's a hiker with a mobility impairment. Uh, so, you know, the people first, if you can think about that and not use some of the, the old terms that we have them listed there. And again, I'm, this presentation will be available, you can print it out, uh, Daryl will have it, and we got it on our website with Florida Disabled Outdoor Association. It's a good little training if you do have employees uh, that work for you with you to provide programs. It's very, uh, it's very readily achievable to learn some of these things. And all people are not sensitive to it. I know we in, in conversation, even when you get around people with disabilities, when they're comfortable with each other and they're talking and jiving and shooting the bull, they'll use some of these words uh, that do not offend and are not improper if you will in the right context but you know if you're talking to folks you don't know and you're in a position where you need to be portraying an image or a a a, 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 a I guess position of, of respect you need to make sure you use the right language so that's important and I'm not going to dwell on it anymore but you'll see some of the differences there go ahead Dara okay some more of the words that you want to just stay away from and over time, you know, you'll see some words there that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we've used 
and we've tried to eliminate uh, because they are offensive sometimes. And one that I see used all the time is wheelchair bound. That doesn't sound bad, but you know, a person who uses a wheelchair is not wheelchair bound. He's not, or she, he or she's not tied to that chair. He or she gets out of that chair and functions like other people. So wheelchair bound is not a good one. Uh, so we want to stay away from things like that. And then some of the other uh, mental health kind of things are very offensive to some. So just stay away from some of the terms there and just remember people first. They're people. Names, if, if available, or a description of who or what they're doing or, or their identity. You know, bird watcher. It's not a handicapped bird watcher. It's just a bird watcher who may have a, some type of disability. Go ahead. Okay, and then even more importantly, or just as important as the words that we use when we interact with people with disabilities is how do we interact? And this uh, is real important, and I learned it firsthand because now I went from being very able-bodied to riding a wheelchair for a whole year before I could walk with a walker, then a, then a cane, and then it's finally to no assistance at all. But I told you earlier, I grew up in a Winn-Dixie grocery store. I was a store manager for my last four years before I retired. And uh, I was very comfortable spending half my life in a, in a grocery store. Well, I remember very specifically my first trip into a grocery store in a wheelchair. Let me tell you, that was not a very enjoyable trip. Being in that chair in those aisles with people around you everywhere, I felt like I was always in the way and I felt like I was a burden to people. Folks wouldn't look at me. I'm always a very friendly, eye to eye, smiling kind of person. I couldn't even smile to people to have an interaction because they didn't want to look at the person in a wheelchair. So they didn't know how to handle it. They were scared to make eye contact with me. And it's very, it was so obvious to me and I never thought about that before. But uh, that person in a wheelchair is just a person. You just relax and be courteous, you know, eye contact and speaking uh, is very important. And I had to learn that firsthand, but just do know that the more casual you are with people uh, and relaxed, the better. And once you get to know people with disabilities, they're just people. Go ahead, Dara. Okay, and here's, again, here's part of the, my little lesson here that many times I have to uh, dwell into folks. But because you're all outdoor people and you're all uh, understand the benefits of outdoor recreation, the things that you see on the left there in quality of life and self-esteem and stress reduction, uh, depression reduction, all those things we know now. We used to say it because we believed it. Now research is proving all those things are very valid. And now that we've gone through this corona crisis pandemic, and people have been shut in for months and we're going stir crazy and uh, our mental health has been affected. Uh, people are stressed, people are depressed and there's no better healing source than time in nature. And that's, you know, not just an opinion anymore. Now we have very smart researchers and scientists that are proving that with very controlled research. So outdoor is great, but it's also Social benefits, giving people a place to interact with family and friends. Remember my story about the boat? It wasn't about fishing. It was being about outdoors with my family and friends and what that really meant to me. It meant everything to me. Uh, but that socialization of getting outside and doing recreation things together, you know, all the benefits you said are tremendous. So enough on benefits. Y'all get that. <clears throat> Now the world is starting to get it because of uh, the corona condition. This is a, yeah, this is a, a unique little graph, if you will, that tells a big story in a little space and time there. Uh, what we can do, when I say we, both our society or our organizations and our programs, when we can do something to provide access and opportunity for someone with a disability, to better enhance their life and to enjoy themselves and get out and do something and go somewhere and meet people. It's going to really directly influence their whole family. Their family benefits from it. Their, 
their brothers, their siblings, their parents, their grandparents, because of that enjoyment factor and that bonding and that socialization. So the more we do for one person, we'll be helping the whole family and that whole circle of people around them. And then to expand upon that concept, when we help families, we're helping our whole community. So the health and wellness and, and contribution that family grow as our committee, as our community uh, benefits from that family's benefits. And our, our people who are not even involved in the actual program or activities are benefiting because we have people watching and learning. We see people with disabilities doing things outdoors and you say, well, you know what? They, they belong here too. And uh, so it doesn't take a one-on-one uh, -on -one disability person to affect society. When that person with disability is out there doing things, everybody who's around them will see that and enjoy that and appreciate that and accept disability and inclusion. And you know, one of the lessons I learned in that hospital setting in my 30 years with the FDOA <coughs> is diversity. And that's not just black and white, and male and female, and all the other demographics that we love to label people with. That's diversity of interest. That's what I really learned about therapeutic recreation is that everyone has different interests. And it's okay to be different. It's okay to like one thing and not another. I would imagine there's very few of you that are watching this little presentation tonight that would do what I used to do get up at 3 30 4 o'clock in the morning go out in the woods and run around like a wild man try to call a turkey and kill a turkey very few people enjoy that but those who do enjoy it are getting benefits of that outdoor recreation and they're contributing to our overall efforts to conserve and preserve and protect our natural resources so we need to be uh i guess respective of others interest and their diverse interest in outdoors and bond together and support each other and you know, it's research now is showing, it's amazing the research we come up with, that most outdoors people do multiple outdoor activities. They're not just so focused on one thing that they do because most folks have several outdoor things they enjoy doing. A lot of trail walkers also love to paddle and a lot of trailers and, and paddlers love bird watching and, and all the fishing and all the things that go along with it. So recreation, uh, users are valuable and we need to stick together. <clears throat> now inclusion, you know, I've, I've talked about accessibility and a little bit about inclusion, but in the early days I spent most of my time on ADA compliance and how do we make our facilities and our programs accessible. Uh, as time progressed, the ADA is 30 years old now, so we've got it in a lot of cases and we'll never get it in some other cases. The world will never be a perfect world and ADA regulations and guidelines are meant to make it functional and better and does a great job. But the real goal should be to include people into society. Inclusion is where we want to go. And what's the difference between inclusion and accessibility? So there's a big difference. Inclusion basically means that we're welcoming people. You can add people of diverse minorities into a group setting of doing things. You integrate them. We called it in school when we, years ago, and I'm that age where I remember all this happening, when we changed the laws and then we had people of color going to school with people, white Caucasians, and we integrated our school, schools. Now that doesn't mean we were welcoming and creating a, 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 a situation of inclusion. We were just putting people together. And that's fine, we need to put people together, but the real root of inclusion is accepting those people and welcoming them to whatever we're doing. Giving those people choices of what they wanna do and how they wanna do it, and then supporting their, their uh, participation along with everybody else. Of course, you do have to have your physical accessibility because that's a, almost a bottom line low bar you have to have because you can't invite people and welcome people if they can't even physically access the program. But also your program accessibility is so important. How you design your programs means a lot. You can be welcoming with your programs or you can be discouraging and make participation more difficult without even meaning to by not thinking through how to make your whole program accessible. Uh, and then you can also 
to include people, provide modifications and adaptive equipment so we can change things a little bit in our programs and in our settings to make them more usable and enjoyable. Still with me, Dara? Okay, yes, all right, <coughs> excuse me. And another way that we can show and in, invite and entice more inclusion is in our marketing programs. Uh, I didn't really get a, a, a real good feel on who my audience is tonight. So I'm talking to a lot of different people, a lot of different directions, but a lot of folks who are, are I guess, organizational people are program managers, land managers. <clears throat> if you're promoting your programs, which we need to do, need to make sure that disabilities are represented in those pieces. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to communicate the message to the public. People with disabilities see those cues real quick and easy. Uh, they'll notice a picture of a person in a wheelchair in a setting with other folks. And then when they see that picture, you know, it's not saying people with wheel who use wheelchairs can come here. It's saying we're welcoming everybody. Whether you walk or roll, we, we have that, uh, I guess, basic root philosophy of inclusion. Now we need to use photos because that's the quick and easy, but also you need to very clearly list what you have that are accessibility features that may be, and I'm not talking about accessible restrooms and the parking lots being emphasized, but we need to emphasize what grand opportunities we have or things that are very special or different so that people with disabilities can enjoy them. Okay, go ahead, Dara. Hope my internet's not sticking out on me here. Dara, you still with me? Yeah, there you go. Okay, etiquette. Uh, and this again is how do you how are you going to be sensitive to people with disabilities? Uh, one of the main things is you don't assume that they can't do things or that they it's not appropriate for them to do things. If you see someone that looks like they might be struggling, uh, one of the things is you just don't jump up and help. Ask them. A lot of folks are real proud that they can drag their canoe or their kayak down to that launch and climb into it by themselves because they're overcoming and and beating some of the barriers that nature puts out there. So uh, it's very important that you ask for your help and think before you speak. Um, simple, basic things that we should always do when we're interacting with people. But again, the disability words, always think about that, you know, and be respective of how you address folks. Basically, people with disabilities are just people. And if you get to that point and you're just being sensitive but not overreacting to the disability and it's even okay to ask about a disability most people with disabilities don't mind telling you and then uh, another way that we can uh, assume or acquire inclusion is just making accommodations readily available and that means changing your programs a little bit providing some assistive technology <clears throat> uh, by request or at your uh, pre determining what might help people. A lot of government agencies and parks and recreation people are learning that if they put the equipment and make it available for folks, then they will be inviting a whole group of people that, that might not come and enjoy the opportunity. And realize that every person with disability usually has three people without disabilities that are with them. So disabil disability does not travel alone. Disability travels in groups and families and including and in a, uh, inclusion of that one disability could enable a whole family again like i said before and then a whole community benefit so accommodations are a great way to provide inclusion and modifications of your rules so you know you got rules that said no no motorized vehicles on this trail well we can modify those rules and you have the right to change those rules to accept modifications for particular disabilities for people to use them <clears throat> and that, that's a big one. And that's something that a lot of our uh, managers don't understand. They think they're, they're tied to those rules and guidelines. Uh, we can't break laws, but we can change rules and guidelines and procedures real easily and need to do it. Go ahead, Daryl. 
And this is because I did this last presentation for FWC. They've done a great job of, of working to enhance their programs and outdoors. They're one of the most state parks in FWC and forestry, our biggest three, I guess, outdoor recreation providers statewide that we deal with. And they've done a great job of fee exemptions, uh, mobile impaired certification that allows the whole quota hunt program that we developed years ago. And those were kind of adaptations or uh, ability to accommodate different disabilities into a regular program. And then you can have accommodation requests where an individual wants to do something somehow a little bit differently. They can ask for a modification of the rules and you as property managers can accommodate them by changing your rules. Uh, they've done the SUV permits. They've done uh, what we call AMP permit to use four wheelers in areas where they're not normally used, crossbow permits. So FWC has done a great job of bending over to accept and embrace concepts of inclusion and disability in the outdoor recreation world, mostly hunting and fishing. And of course, wildlife viewing now is real big with FWC and I worked a lot with them. Assistive technologies, I see the flag, so thank you, Dara. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, different equipment and things that we can add for or include for people with disabilities to use. Simple little things. You notice the little pontoon boat here has got the outriggers on it for you paddlers. You probably wouldn't want that unless you felt like you needed that extra safety. But for many times, little simple assistive technology thing can make a difference. I mentioned my electric fishing reel. That enabled me to go fishing where, with one hand where I would never figure I'd be able to do it. And I figured out other ways to do it since, but assistive technology is a great way to get people outdoors and using different uh, modifications and equipment that's being developed, developed. Okay, another way to include people is disability events. And you saw my, my sports ability teaser, if you will, of uh, having and sponsoring and going to disability events are great ways to learn more about how to do a better job of providing access to nature. So participate in those uh, events and activities. I'd love to see Audubon get involved with some of the disability things. As a matter of fact, I will invite you to our next outdoor event so you can maybe set up a little table and show that, you know, what you do and how you're welcoming to people with disabilities to participate in our conservation efforts and our club effect that, that the Audubon Society does to enhance our nature and protect it. <clears throat> Go ahead, Daryl. Okay, well that brings me to the end then. And I don't know how I've done on my time here, Daryl, because I'm pretty, I'll blame my head injury. Now remember, I got shot in the head and I've got serious brain injuries. So I have no concept of time. I could have been talking for two hours as far as I know, but we've got time for questions. You're gonna do a chat room questions, I think. And look, I see 23 chats. So how do you wanna do this, Dara? All right, are we here? Can we hear me? I hear you and see you. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, we're just gonna field questions to the Q&A. Um, but before that, hi everybody, uh, I'm Dara, I've been advancing it forward every so often. Thank you so much, David, for being with us again. Um, we really appreciate you. And that was, and even though I, I've had time to review and go over the PowerPoint um, a few times before, um, it was incredibly helpful just to hear you talk about it. And uh, especially the people first language. I have, I have a lot of uh, just notes about that. Um, a lot of ADA questions. Um, so, but nonetheless, thank you. Um, now I know, Real quick, I know you mentioned this in your presentation, but just because it was so important, um, I always like to start with why. why. Why is outdoor recreation really important, especially outdoor recreation for everybody? Well, that's what we've discovered now with this corona thing, that it is important for everybody. When you do not have it, then you realize how valuable it is. So I guess that's the going around about way of saying if you don't have it, you get it. You understand how important it is. but like I said, research has shown that green time, green space, just time in nature is very healing and very soothing and reduces stress and the mental health uh, benefits of outdoor nature-based recreation are just phenomenal. And it's, as a matter of fact, now we're writing doctors, 
prescriptions. Go to a state park. They'll write a prescription to go to a state park. So it's smart people figuring it out too, not just those folks that like to get outdoors and have a good time. Um, absolutely. Uh, I I I wondered um, though because it was you. So you started you started Florida Disabled Outdoors Association after a hunting accident. Um, but I was curious how long after, uh, how long you felt comfortable, how how long it took for you to feel comfortable recreating outdoors. Well, you know, I guess I discovered my love for the outdoors, like I said before in my talk, staring at the ceiling for three months. The things I thought about was the outdoor recreation. I spent three months in that hospital. And I went back to school and spent, I guess, four years finishing my two more years of college at FSU. I was a slow learner. But during that time, <clears throat> I realized I needed to pick a path to go. And what I want to do was something that meant something to me. The outdoors had become so in, ingrained into me as how important it is, the value of getting outdoors was important. So I started the, the organization while in school, really as a class project at FSU. All my business classes that most young kids take and they're given these assignments. A lot of times these hypothetical marketing, marketing endeavors that you have to invent and come up with. Well, every class assignment project that I had to do I used a real life vision and a real life goal. I wanted to create an organization to help people get outdoors and, and to learn about nonprofits and then how to run a business. And so I used my school and plugged in what I really wanted to do in, with my life and my vision. I did that immediately. So starting back to school in 89, I think a year out of, I was still in a wheelchair, a year out of the hospital. And then for the next four years, 1994, I graduated. I started the FDOA in 1990, so I was still in school and didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it, and so that's kind of kind of the point, you know, to start right off the bat. And I guess I've always been that kind of person who wants to help other people, and I never realized that before. I just kind of understood that was part of my DNA. Even in the hospital, I was trying to cheer on the other folks, the patients, and get them up and get them going, and uh, get them to doing things and. So I'm, I was very fortunate. I might be different. Now, there's depression and there's hard times and, and denial when you go through disability rehabilitation. But I was very fortunate that it's just part of my chemistry, I guess, to get up and get going immediately. Yeah, I think there is a question from Chris Rowe. Yes, uh, yes, I see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How can He asked how we can help uh, community leaders make spaces, programs, and organizations more accessible. So I guess, David, if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, different strategy, strategies for advocating to, you know, city councils or FWC or different ways you've done that in the past. Okay, yes. Well, there's a simple little saying, and it, it just hits home. Nothing about us without us. If you think about that little slogan, if people who are managers, leaders, uh, policymakers, will include people with disabilities who get it and have lived it and know it and advocate for disabilities. They can create programs and, and facilities that are accessible and more inclusive at the get-go. But if they wait until after they develop their policies and their programs, then you're coming back trying to change them to include people with disabilities on the back end you're, you're paddling upstream. So I would say start early and include people of interest and knowledge that can help with that program. And I think uh, Yusuf maybe had a question about um, maybe if you're aware of any kind of um, hiking or birding tours, et cetera, for the uh, visually impaired. Do you know anything about those kind of things or like any um, yeah, we have a database on our website, fdoa.org, that I'm sure we'll share the information with you somewhere in the presentation or later. <clears throat> Florida Disabled Outdoor Association, fdoa.org. We have an iFind, which is a database of programs, products, destinations, events, where we list a lot of the opportunities that are out there. But I know as far as vision impaired, St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge even did a little braille boardwalk with some uh, braille and rope guidelines to lead people out to a dock to overview to oversee this little wildlife pond with birds in it and stuff uh, and it's much more common to have push button 
audio uh, kiosk now. So when you get even in the refuge educational center, there's things to see, but also those things you see, they have a, an audio box. You press a button and it'll play you a, uh, a pre-recorded video of what you're seeing or what's important or what's enhancing. The, uh, <clears throat> what's the uh, estuary place down at East Point? Help me somebody, some of you naturalists. Uh, there's the initial oh, spark. Bottle Coffee Bay, is it? No. No, it's right there on in the East Point, but it's right on the o Apalachicola Bay. But anyway, they have a real good kiosk system of displays in their educational center. You can press a button and listen to a story about all the different wildlife that they have on and the uh, uh, plant base, and then even the history and culture. I can't even think of the initials. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's a very unique it's place, and they've done a. E R, it's A N E R R, something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, you've got a NUR, a NUR. Right. Yes, very good. But anyway, so there is audio for people who are vision impaired. Uh, and again, working with people with vision impairments, we have a great uh, uh, resource here in Tallahassee of people who are to the uh, Division of Blind Services and individuals that are willing to help out. You know, I've learned a little bit about vision impairments over the years, but I'm not the expert. <clears throat> but, you know, you find ways to adapt and, and adjust. And, and when you go to a program, and if you have a vision impairment, ask. That's the first thing to do. Ask the, the managers. Ask the people who are running the program. Tell them that you have a vision impairment and what do you have? How can I see what's there? And if you don't ask, many times you'll never know it's there, even if it is there. And a lot of the modifications or adaptations are done on by request just because we don't do a good job of promoting them and advertising them. So my advice to people is to ask and then pursue it. If you don't get the right answer, pursue it. Put a little pressure on them. Let them know you're interested. Uh, you know, the first thing I hear is when I start working on accessibility, oh, I never see a person in a wheelchair here. Why should we build a ramp or why should we make it wheelchair accessible? Well, duh, you never see a person in a wheelchair because they can't get there. So we need to think about it early and create it, open that opportunity so people of all abilities can participate. And uh, we had one more question from Chris Rowe. Um, he asked what kind of programs successfully help children who have disabilities enjoy nature? Do you have, um, do you know any kind of programs for children? Yes, uh, there's quite a few for children now because like I said in my little spill a while ago, that's our future. Uh, FWC has a great program they've developed, and I think it's called Marine Quest, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a nationwide education program that school teachers use. I think the fourth grade teachers now are using that program to introduce their classrooms to nature. Uh, so they're doing a great job in the schools. Uh, field trips used to be the way to go. You know, that's kind of a, on hold right now, so we're not doing many field trips. But uh, as far as youth in the community, uh, the biggest problem for youth learning about and enjoying the outdoors is the lack of parents that are going to give them that inspiration and that experience. Our grandparents and our parents are how most people are introduced to the outdoors. And now, unfortunately, because society's changed and we don't have as many of our parents doing some of the outdoor recreation activities, they're not sharing them with their children when they have children. So we've got some gaps there. Now, the good news is I see the, the country's changing. We're getting greener and greener with our thoughts. Our young people now, you know, especially college, high school and college age kids, going back to where, you know, I'd hate to say my old hippie days, but back in the, in the days where uh, nature was more enjoyable and we did a lot of the, the outdoor things, now conservation and of course with the whole global warming and you know the uh, the state of our um, <clears throat> outdoor pollution and some of the negative things that are happening our young people are getting it so we'd love to get them involved and I said before earlier one of the secrets to protecting our resources is by getting people involved with outdoor recreation it's hard to go out there and just make a conservation person out of someone teach them, you know, all the technical needs and, and uh, issues. But if you can get them to go outside and just enjoy the outdoors and learn about the plants and, and the animals on a very realistic one-on-one, -on -one, then they're going to become interested and they're going to place value on that and they're going to want to protect it. 
So getting them outdoors is up to us parents, really. Awesome, David. Well, um, I don't think we have too many more questions, but uh, I just want to say thank you. It's, you're always inspiring and very eye-opening. I was getting texts from people during your, ch your chat um, telling me they hadn't thought about this stuff and they were really into it. So um, I think it's a message that opens everybody's eyes and I think that they'll look at everything differently from here going forward and see what outdoor recreation situations they're in. Um, Dar, did you have anything else you want to add? I just also want to thank you. I, I want to thank you, David. Um, yes, I, I've seen a few, uh, only at a few of the beaches um, nearby. I think I saw one at St. George Island Beach and I, I, I said I'll go Cockney because I know I've seen um, a wheelchair accessibility um, or a wheelchair accessible, excuse me, uh, walkway. And that was incredible to see. Um, and it, it was just very eye-opening exactly as you said. So just to know, like if you ask for these things, they can be provided. Um, and it's just, it's just incredible what you do. Thank you so much. Um, well, some of the, the sports ability event that we did, we did at O'Clock and River State Park for years. That sidewalk and those improvements are done because we asked for them to be done. When you, they've had their, their record attendance day at our disability event in that state park. Never in history has as many people attended that state park in one day as they did for our sports ability event. So uh, the demand was there. The state park get it. They're doing a great job of really becoming more aware of and including people of all abilities into their programming. I've got a great relationship with them that I've earned over the years through different endeavors and, and complicated methods over the years, but they're doing a great job. And I work real close. As a matter of fact, just talked with them yesterday in a uh, ADA coordinators group helping them solve individual problems. So I'm here to help any of the folks out there that were on this program earlier that are looking for a little guidance or advice. Uh, I'd love to help them out in any way I can. And that's another thing that's unique about the Florida Disabled Outdoor Association. Yes, we serve people with disabilities, but we serve people who provide opportunities and recreation for people with disabilities. So us helping from the provider and the consumer really makes a lot of progress and gets a lot of good things done. So we're here to help and we'd love to help anybody in any way we can. And uh, feel free to call on us. Thank, thank you, David. You. Thank you, this, this was very helpful. So yes, thank you everybody for attending. And, and David, also thank you for that last final plug um, on, on um, advocacy, because um, it's incre that's incredibly important. And I also, I really like that part of your, your background where you got into this, this all started with a school project. And we're just about to start up with a few um, FSU students um, with a, a new mentorship program. We have uh, some sustainability fellows. That's what Heather was mentioning earlier with the Bat House project. So uh, it's, it's just really inspiring to hear that in action and to see what everything that can come of it, um, including major changes to state parks. So thank you again. Yes. All right. Future's bright. Let's just keep on plugging and, and, and make this a better place to live. Exactly. All right. Well, that is it. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, if you have any other, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, at Appalachia Audubon or at Florida to Save Outdoors Association. And if you have, would you, if you would like to link, excuse me, if you'd like to get more information about FDOA. you can find their information here. All right, thank you everybody. This presentation will be available on our website. Have a good evening. Thank you very much.